Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 says this, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. So there's a blessing in reading this. So I'm going to read the whole chapter, and then we'll go back through it and kind of break down the major themes of it. So Revelation chapter 11. Then I was given a measuring reed like a rod with these words, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count those who worship there, but exclude the courtyard outside the temple and don't measure it because it is given to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days dressed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. They have authority to close up the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. They also have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. When they finish their testimony, the beast that comes out of the abyss will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the main street of the great city, which figuratively is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And some of the people's tribes, languages, and nations will view their bodies for three and a half days and not permit their bodies to be put into a tomb. Those who believe on the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. Great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. At that moment, a violent earthquake took place. A tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Take note. The third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders who were seated before God on the thrones fell face down and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, Lord God, the Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints, and to those who fear your name, both small and great. And the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, an earthquake, and severe hail. So now we are all blessed, right? So that's what Revelation 1 says that if we hear these words, we are blessed. So the reason I read it all in one go is because there's a lot going on, but there's a few major themes that I want to focus on. So as we dive into it, um, authority is given. So verse 1, then I was given a measuring reed like a rod with these words, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count those who worship there. So in the Old Testament with the prophets, and happens with many of the prophets, they are sometimes given a measuring rod or a plumb line, and they are told to measure what they see. And it's a way of um, enacting judgment. Okay, so if you, if you measure up or if it fits the dimensions of God, then you are part of his people, you're holy, you're redeemed. If you're outside the measurements, then you are rebellious, idolatrous, 
um, lawless, okay? So this is a theme that is carried over from the Old Testament prophets. So a couple examples. One is from Zechariah chapter 2. He says, I looked up and saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. I asked, where are you going? He answered me, to measure Jerusalem, to determine its width and length. And in Ezekiel chapter 40, we read, In the 25th year of our Lord, of our exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month and the 14th year after Jerusalem had been captured, on that very day the Lord's hand was on me, and he brought me there. In visions of God, he took me to the land of Israel and set me down on a very high mountain. He brought me there, and I saw a man whose appearance was like brawn with a linen cord and a measuring rod in his hand. He was standing by the city gate. He spoke to me, son of man, look with your eyes, listen with your ears, and pay attention to everything I'm going to show you. For you have been brought here so that I might show it to you. Report everything you see to the house of Israel. So these are two examples of the Old Testament prophets having visions where there is a measuring rod of some type. And what they're measuring is the city of Jerusalem, which contains the temple. So what is happening here to John is... He's being given this vision, and then he's being told to take this measuring rod and then to begin to measure the temple of God. Now, why is there a temple in heaven? Well, this goes back to the Old Testament. When Moses and the Israelites are beginning to wander in the wilderness, they begin to build a big tent called the tabernacle, correct? And these are the parts of Exodus that you skip over in your yearly reading plan because after all the cool stuff happens, there's several chapters of construction instructions, okay? Where it's just like, and you make it this long. And then you sit there wondering, how long is a cubit really, right? And then it's like, now you're going to use this type of thread, and then you're going to do this. Well, why is that all there? Because the blueprint itself for the tabernacle comes from heaven, Moses is shown this picture of God's dwelling place in heaven. And he says, now I want you to make a replica on earth. And then the temple is eventually built by Solomon. And that is built off of the directions of God and also the dimensions of the tabernacle. So John is seeing God's dwelling place in heaven. And he's measuring like the Old Testament prophets did. And they're measuring basically... Where is God's dwelling place and where are his people and where are they not? Right? So there's a, there's a distinction happening here. There's a separating out between God's people, those who believe in Jesus, and those who don't. Um, so Dr. Brighton says this. He says, The instruction to John to use a measuring rod puts him in line with this prophetic tradition. His measuring of the temple of God and its dwellers indicates that God's people, his holy dwelling will be protected as they carry out the mission given to them, which is the proclamation of the gospel. So John is measuring out God's people from not God's people so that there's a way to tell the difference. And then as we have read, and what we're going to see is there's this purpose, there's this authority given to God's people to prophesy, to proclaim the word of God, right? So before... We get a little distracted with that word prophesy or, um, you know, prophet and prophetic tradition like Dr. Brighton uses. Um, The Lutheran understanding and interpretation, it's not just Lutheran, but we are Lutheran, um, of prophet is not someone who just speaks about the future. Okay. That is an aspect of it. But the priority and main purpose of prophets in the Old Testament and in the New was to declare God's truth, God's word, and say, if you repent, if you turn, he will bless you, he will redeem you, he will bring you back home. You will be within these measuring bounds of his temple, of his holy dwelling. If you don't, there will be consequences and judgment for your idolatry and sin. And if you read the Old Testament prophets, that's basically all they do. And within that, they do make promises about the future in specific ways about how God will work his redemption for his people, right? Which is why you get specific promises about 
Jesus being born in Bethlehem and to a virgin and then the, how he will be the suffering servant who by his stripes or by his wounds, we are healed, correct? Right? So those are mixed in. But the overall, um, what's called the prophetic tradition is God's people declaring God's wor- word to the world so that they may repent and be brought in within the measuring line. So we have this temple, we have this court. In verse two, it says, but exclude the courtyard outside the temple. Don't measure it because it is given to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So if you have a Bible that has um, study notes in it or pictures in it, oftentimes at some point within it, either in the midst, middle of the pages or at the end, there's usually pictures or diagrams of what the tabernacle looked like, what the temple looked like. There's two different temples in your Bible, though, which is why there's some confusion sometimes. So when Solomon built the temple, there was um, two courtyards. There was the place where the high priests go and all the church workers would go to make the sacrifices and everything, and the people could be in this inner courtyard. And then there was this outer courtyard where other people who were not part of Israel could be. When Herod rebuilt the temple, he um, added to it because he was really arrogant um, (laughs) and he wanted it to be called Herod's temple. So when he rebuilt the temple, they obviously had the inner part where the sacrifices and the priests and the people could go. And then you had this outer courtyard, which was the Gentile courtyard. Eventually, it became known as um, the courtyard of prayer, where anybody from all the nations could come and pray. This is, by the way, the space where um, the story of Jesus flipping over the, the tables and saying, my, my, my house will be a house of prayer. He does it in that courtyard, which is called the courtyard of prayer. But it was where the Gentiles were allowed to go. They couldn't go into the inner courtyard, okay? You couldn't go into the inner place. So what's happening here is John is, uh, Revelation is picking up on that imagery of the, of the temple having the inner place for God's people and then the outer place for the Gentiles or the nations. Um, Gentiles, nations, the same word in Greek, so they're used differently. Uh, essentially, what happens with the New Testament authors is that... Uh, Gentiles or the nations becomes this catch-all for anybody that doesn't believe, okay? So it doesn't mean that, like, oh, only the Jews are going to be counted within this. They're just saying, oh, the nations, meaning more so what we would say, like, the pagan nations, right? So there's God's people that are in the inner courtyard. On this outer courtyard are the pagan nations, all right? So... Another quote from Dr. Brighton, he says, Though the church will be protected by God so that she can carry out her mission, she will suffer persecution and even death as a result of the pagan nation's opposition. Right? And this is what verse 2 says, They will trample the holy city for 42 months. Right? So he's saying don't measure them because they are the ones who are working against the church. And if you are... John and the early church during the writing of Revelation, you're immediately going to be thinking, yeah, the Romans um, and their empire and their pagan gods and how they are persecuting and killing the church, right? So John would immediately be thinking of the Roman Empire and all of its works against the people of God, against the church. So verse 3, God says, I will grant my witnesses authority to prophesy For 1,260 days dressed in sackcloth. Now we're going to get to the prophets and the witnesses and everything here. We're going to talk about time for a moment. So we have three numbers here in Revelation 11. And numbers are what make everybody go cuckoo nuts when they're studying the book of Revelation. Um, You could probably find all kinds of interesting books on the internet and uh, YouTube videos all about how certain things are going to happen at a specific time because they took the numbers out of Revelation and they've done the math for you. Isn't that so nice that they did the math for you? So uh, th- th- there are traditions that take some of these numbers quite literally throughout Revelation. 
the Lutheran Church is not one of those. Um, we take the numbers as figurative or metaphors that they're all they're conveying a point for God's people, not giving us a calendar. Okay, so we have 42 months. We have 1,260 days, and then later on in Revelation 11, we have you know three and a half years, or sometimes just three and a half days. So we have these three numbers, 42, 1,260, three and a half. The short answer is they are all meaning the same thing. Okay, now I'm going to walk you through why that is our interpretation as the Lutheran Church. Okay, so um, 42 months is equal to 1,260 days based on a lunar calendar. If you're not aware, the Hebrew calendar, along with a lot of ancient um, Eastern calendars, was based on the moon cycles, not on the sun. So they have a lunar calendar, which is why if you have any um, Jewish relatives or Jewish friends, the dates of their holidays are always fluctuated within a a span, right? They're not always at the same exact time. It's because they're holy days are still following the lunar calendar, okay? We have a solar-based calendar because of the Romans, and we have our calendar today because of the Catholics, because they fixed it for us when they did all the math. Okay, so um, 42 months is equal to 1,260 days within a lunar calendar. It's also equal to three and a half years within a lunar calendar. Now, why did God pick these numbers specifically? Well, we're going to look at a few things. One is a connection to the book of Daniel. So in Daniel chapter 7, because Daniel, how many of you have read some of Daniel before, right? Now, usually what happens with Daniel is we get to Daniel in the lion's den. That's kind of where we stop. Uh, Because after that, it looks more like Revelation than the story of Daniel, because he he begins to see a lot of eschatological um, end times prophecies. Okay, so Daniel uh, chapter 7, verse um, 25. He will speak words against the Most High and oppress the Holy Ones of the Most High. He will intend to change religious festivals and laws, and the Holy Ones will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. And then you're saying, well, Pastor, there's no number there. Okay. This phrase, time, times, and half a time, will show up later on in Revelation. And it's a weird idiomatic way of saying three and a half. It's a a Hebrew idiomatic way of saying three and a half years. Okay, so I'm just showing you that what John's language is, is again connecting to the rest of Scripture. Okay, and then Daniel chapter 12 Uh, We read in verses 6 and 11. One of them said to the man dressed in linen who was above the water of the river, how long until the end of these wondrous things? Um, And in verse 11, from the time the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. So it's a little bit more, but what we see in Daniel is there's this question of these wondrous things um, wondrous does not always mean good in the, in the Bible, right? Um, it just means things that are way beyond my understanding. And for Daniel, he was seeing things of suffering and all kinds of other stuff happening. And he's asking, how long is this going to last? And he's given a number, 1,290 days. John has 1,260 days, but they're very similar. So again, the point here is to show you that John's language, the language of Revelation, is connected to the whole of Scripture. It's not something just random. Okay, so now, um, Dr. Brighton, speaking about this connection, he says, both Daniel and Revelation, both Daniel and Revelation, this time period is that period of time when God's people on earth will be trodden underfoot by the pagan nations Daniel sees this time of suffering and persecution prophetically in the future, while John sees it as the time in which he is living, a time that will also continue until the end of the present world, 
at Christ's return. So I, I like the way he helps us connect it to where what Daniel is seeing is happening in the future. Um, that future is now in John's life. Um, and if you want, you can read Daniel, get a good study Bible. Uh, we're able to see Daniel's prophecies come true throughout history with different empires coming to power and falling. Okay, uh, Rome being the final one that Daniel prophesied. So John is now living within that reality. And Jesus, or God from the throne, speaks to him with this language of Daniel to let him know that this persecution, this suffering for God's people, when will it end? Because that's always the question we want to ask, right? When, when is this going to end? The answer being when Christ returns. So this is an important theme for chapter 11 and all of Revelation. <clears throat> and I'm going to mention it again later on. Um, but I'm just going to say it this way. And Dr. John MacArthur, who's a pastor out in California, a very famous author and teacher, um, he teaches it this way. Uh, and I love how bluntly he says it. He says to the church, uh, we don't win on earth. We have this misconception and as Dr. MacArthur says, especially in America, that somehow as the church, we can rise up and have victory in this life. If you read the Bible, we have a victory, but it comes later when Christ returns. He's our victory. We don't win here and now. This is what God is saying to John. It's what he said to Daniel. Look, when is this going to end? When I come back. So what does that mean? Well, it means we're going to be persecuted. We're going to be talked about poorly. We're going to be mistreated as God's people here on earth. And our victory will come when our Lord returns. Okay, so these, these terms of 42 months, three and a half, 1,260 days are meant to show it's happening here and now. It's this time until Christ returns to give us our ultimate victory. Um, but it also is meant to show you that it's temporary. This won't last forever because Christ is going to return and Christ's reign is what lasts forever. His victory that he gives to his people is what lasts forever. All right, so, um, so we've seen from Daniel why these numbers were chosen. So I want to give you some other reasons why these numbers were specifically chosen because you know, God could have just said, hey, it's temporary, right? <laughs> right? That would have been a lot simpler than 42 months, 1,260 days, time and times and a half a time, right? But, but why does he choose these numbers? So one <clears throat> is a man named Antiochus Epiphanes IV. He is not in your Bible. Okay, so Antiochus um, Epiphanes IV was a... Um, ruler over Israel and a big part of the Middle East and then part of Egypt. He came after Alexander the Great. If you're not um, fresh on your history, Alexander the Great conquered pretty much everything in the known world at the time, from Greece all the way to India and all the way down to Egypt. And then he died at a very young age. And his generals decided to have a civil war over who got to be in charge. They eventually came to an agreement and kind of divided it into five sections. And the di different generals became the rulers of their sections. Antiochus Epiphanes IV, his family became the rulers over what we would call Israel and parts of the Middle East and then down into Egypt. <clears throat> now, you have to know about him. He hates the Jewish people and he hates the Jewish faith. And in beginning around 168 BC, he really begins to terrorize them. And it lasts for three and a half years. Now, I want to tell you what he did so you understand why these numbers were chosen. So when he outlawed the Jewish faith, which was, you know, the faith of the Bible. It's the faith that if you and I were living at the time, we would have because we'd be following the Bible, right? Um, what he did was he made it illegal to read the Torah in public, which is translated for us as it's now illegal to read the Bible in public. 
So we wouldn't be able to gather and have someone read the scriptures in our gatherings. Um, He made it illegal to be a church worker or a priest. So the Levite tribe was heavily persecuted during this time. Now they did have a high priest and the priest at the time, but they were all chosen by Antiochus himself. And then they had all of their Hebrew names taken from them and he gave them Greek names. So it was kind of like a state-run religion. But they, when they took the Torah away and they said, no, you can't really practice these things, right? Like how much of our faith can we really say is our faith that they say you can't gather, you can't read scripture publicly, and you can't have any uh, religious leaders. Well, like, okay, <laughs> um, <clears throat> right? That would be severe persecution. Now, the ultimate thing that was horrendous that he did was he built or had a statue of Zeus put into the Holy of Holies of the temple. And then he sacrificed pigs upon that altar. So if you don't understand, the Holy of Holies was where the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be. It's God's specific presence amongst his people. And only the high priest could go there one day a year, right? The Day of Atonement. And they would make sacrifices that were approved by God on behalf of his people. So what Antiochus did was, well, I'm going to put a statue of Zeus there to mock your God. And then to mock you even further, instead of doing your God-approved sacrifices, I'm going to sacrifice pigs, which are unclean animals, according to your faith, upon this altar. Now, this greatly upset the Jewish people. right? And it would upset us if these kinds of things were happening to us. We'd say, well, no, we're going to stay faithful to God. So Antiochus, like any ruler, wants to expand his domain. So he goes down to Egypt. And there's a rumor that gets circulated and sent back home to Jerusalem that says he died in battle down in Egypt. So a revolt begins. We're going to take back Jerusalem. We're going to take back the temple. And we're going to worship God the right way. Well, Antiochus didn't die in Egypt. He came back. He was really angry that there was a rebellion. This rebellion is called the Maccabean Revolt. So if you ever heard of the two books, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, that almost made it into the Bible, but didn't quite. Um, But they give us a lot of history. And most of what we know about the culture of Jesus' day actually comes from those two books. This revolt of being faithful to God's word no matter what was led by a group of people called the Pharisees. Now, in the Gospels, they get a bad rap, right? They are pretty much the, the people always going after Jesus, right? Well, the Pharisees began, their ancestors were the ones that led this revolt. And they were the ones that said, no matter what happens to us, We are going to be faithful to God's word and we are going to obey his laws no matter what the consequences are. And if you read 1st and 2nd Maccabees, you can read a lot about this. Um, There are stories in there about how one of the things that Antiochus would do during this three and a half period of revolt was um, he would take, you know, captured people and then he would torture them in front of their families. And so... And there are stories where they would cut out their tongues or they would boil them alive in front of their family members and they would tell their family members, we'll stop doing this to your brother, your sister, your mother, your father if you forsake your faith in God. And the Pharisees were the group of people that said, we're not going to forsake our faith in God. So my point with this is, um, there's a reason the Pharisees were so highly regarded by the people during the time of Jesus. Now, eventually, they, yeah, did they get off track on some things? Yeah. But they're the ones that stood up and said, no matter what the suffering is, we're going to be faithful to God's word. This revolt lasted for about three and a half years, and they won. They, at the end of it, they had their freedom. They had their victory, which lasted for a little while until the Romans came in and said, we rule the whole world now. All right. So why does God, what would be one of the reasons God uses this number of 42 or three and a half 
Well, he's telling his people, look, you have this history of being faithful to me no matter what the consequences are, even when, as Revelation says, they will trample on the Holy City. They will trample all over you. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be death. You have this story. You have this picture of, in your tradition, of being faithful no matter what. And at the end of three and a half years, what happened? There was a victory for God's people. All right, so um, that's one of the reasons historically this could be picked up. Another one, I didn't put on your outline here, but another one is uh, around 67 AD, there was another revolt. This one was against um, the Romans, and it lasted a little after 70 AD, so about three and a half years. It ended with the destruction of the temple, which Jesus had prophesied would happen, right? Um, <clears throat> so there's that. Elijah shut the heavens for three and a half years. You can read that about this in Kings about Elijah. Um, James references this when he says, oh, Elijah was a man of faith and a man of prayer, and he opened and closed the heavens, but you know, God gave him as a prophet this authority. If you pray, the heavens will close, and there was a drought in the land, right? Um, and then Moses and the Israelites wandered the wilderness for 42 years. Years Now, we usually say 40 because that's the specific time of the wilderness wanderings, but they spent two years um, getting to and around Sinai. So their whole journey from Egypt to the promised land was 42 years. What happened to them during that time? There was suffering. There was hardships. There was conflict. But eventually, where do they end up? In the promised land. So these times are given to us not to say... There's going to be exactly three and a half years of suffering for the church. Just so you know, uh, <laughs> if that was true, that number's already been used up, okay, in the time of John. These numbers are there to show God's people a story from their history that says, yes, there is suffering for my people in this life, in this earth, but at the end of that, I give my people victory. I give them life. And what Revelation 11 eventually is going to tell us is what that ultimate victory looks like. Okay, so now we come to what's called the two witnesses in verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. They have authority to close up the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. They also have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. So Zechariah uh, chapter 4 gives us similar language. Um, starting in verse 1 of Zechariah chapter 4. Then the angel who was speaking with me then turned and roused me as one awakened out of sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I replied, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top. The lampstand also has seven lamps at the top with seven spouts for each of the lamps. There are also two olive trees beside it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. Then I asked the angel who was speaking with me, what are these, my Lord? And then I love the angel's response, don't you know what they are? <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes you just have to kind of laugh at the humor that's going on with the prophets. We always think of them of like, oh, they're prophets of God. And even they're like, what is this? And I just like that the angel's like, you don't know? <laughs> you know, and just be like, no, I don't. It's a vision of heaven. I don't get it. Can you explain it to me? And I said, no, my Lord. He's more reverent about it. So he answered me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by strength or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. That's an incredibly important verse for, for John and the people of God that are going through this time of suffering of how are we going to have victory? How are we going to make a difference in the world, and the answer is not by power, not by might, but by what? By the Spirit of God. So, what do these images represent? So, the lampstands represent the church or God's people on earth. So, 
you know, he sees these pictures of these lampstands in Zechariah, it's the people of God. There's these two olive trees, by right? From earlier in Revelation, remember early on we saw the, the seven letters to the seven churches. We saw, we were told by Jesus, the lampstands represent what? His churches, his people on earth. So the olive trees <laughs> represent God's anointed prophets and ministers to the church or to his people. And so in the Old Testament, we have the Zechariah, we have Zerubbabel, and says, this is the word of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel is one of the leaders of God's people at this time. And if you think about it this way, you have these lamps, right? They are shining the light into the world, right? And if you remember, we made a song about it, <laughs> right? And then in the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus say about lights and lamps? Talking about us as the church, that we're not supposed to hide it, right? But we let it shine for the whole world to see so that they would glorify God. So we're the light, we're the lamps, we're the people of God shining the light of Jesus into this dark world so that more people will worship him. How did lamps back then get their fuel? From oil. Where does the oil come from? The olive tree. So the olive tree begins to represent the power of God or the word of God, that it is what gives fuel to the people of God to carry out the mission. So you have these two witnesses. You have the people of God. You have the word of God, which comes through the prophets or the, you know, and the, and the apostles and the writers of scripture, right? <clears throat> so <clears throat> then we have <clears throat> this image of Moses and Elijah. <clears throat> at the end here, where it says, they also have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. So, how many of you, as soon as you hear the word plague, automatically think of Moses in the Exodus? Because that's what I do, right? So, we're supposed to think of Moses and Elijah, who was the one that shut up the sky so there's no rain. Now, Elijah did lots of other stuff. Um, the two major prophets from the Old Testament are Moses and Elijah. Now, there's lots of other prophets. Um, there's also, you know, people like Abraham. But within um, Old Testament Jewish tradition, it was Moses and Elijah are the two main guys. Okay. <clears throat> so we're given this image of now we have Moses and Elijah here, and we have this idea of two witnesses. Now, there's a lot of um, interpretations throughout church history going all the way back to the 4th century and the 6th century. They'll talk about who are the two witnesses. Are they actually Moses and Elijah? Because now we have this language that everybody that knew the Bible would be like, that's talking about Elijah and Moses. Or is it just generic? Well, um, the interpretation that I gave you is that it's, it's more representative. Right? It's that it's the people of God. It's the prophetic work of those people proclaiming God's word are the two witnesses. Um, but we use Moses and Elijah as models for that. Because if you look at their lives, what did they do? Well, they spoke God's word, but they also did it with incredible power, right? right? It's through Moses that the plagues happen. And if you look at Elijah, Elijah raises people from the dead. He calls fire down from heaven. He shuts the sky. Like, Elijah is amazing. So they are people that speak the word of God, but they do it with power. And what God is saying here is, in verse 6, they have authority. Right? They, being the witnesses, the church, us, through God's power, through God's word, we have this same Authority. Now, does that mean if you go out and pray, you're going to shut the heavens and it's not going to rain in Kansas City for three and a half years? Well, probably not. But what does it mean for God's people? What does it mean for John in this um, small, suffering church back then? Well, it means you feel like you have no power and authority in the world, but I'm letting you do, know that you actually do, which is why I read the Zechariah passage. Not by power, not by might, by the Spirit of God, that we have authority, we have power, that when we speak God's word, when we shine that light into the world, lives are changed, that there is a difference made. All right, 
So we have all this, and it's like, well, that sounds great. There's going to be suffering. It's not going to last that long. We have authority. We have power. We're able to witness to the world like Moses and Elijah. Um, just a side note, the other reason there's two witnesses, it goes all the way back to Deuteronomy, where when you were bringing a court case, you always had to have um, two witnesses in order to have an authoritative account. Um, when you read the Old Testament prophets, oftentimes they will swear by the heavens and the earth as their witnesses on behalf of God to show they have authority to speak. When Jesus is asked about his authority, he says he has two witnesses, the word of God and his miracles, what he's doing. Um, and then at the transfiguration, there's two witnesses to him being the son of God, which are Moses and Elijah, right? So this idea is, this is why we have authority. God's saying, no, you have everything you need because you're speaking my word and you are my people, all right? But there's other parts to Revelation 11. So it's like, okay, it's not gonna, we have authority, that's great. So the next thing is that uh, the witnesses get killed. So the big theme here is that like opposition is certain. Um, and again, this is a huge theme throughout Revelation. It's an important theme for us is that, look, there's going to be opposition to the Christian faith. There's going to be opposition to the gospel. So stop being surprised. I think sometimes we get thrown off or we um, quit our witnessing because we're, we're like shocked that people didn't want to hear it or that people didn't agree with it. Um, and if you, if you want to experience that, like, just go post a Bible verse online. <laughs> Not everybody's going to be like, man, that's the truth. Love it. Right? There's going to be some people that disagree with it, that. So we have to have this understanding, come to this just acknowledgement that opposition is certain. This is what this time period means. That until Christ's return, we lose. There's, there's suffering and all these things. So... Verse 7, when they finished their testimony, so the two witnesses have stopped speaking. The beast that comes out of the abyss, so if you remember a couple chapters ago, we looked at the abyss, it's the sea, it's the place where Satan dwells, it's his headquarters essentially, and he came, comes out of it, he sends the demons out of it to torment the earth and cause all kinds of harm to God's people. So now that we have the first mention of the beast, okay, we'll get, we'll get to that um, later on in the next couple of chapters. We have the beast coming out of the abyss. We'll make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. So what does that mean? Well, there's going to be opposition in this lifetime against God's people, against you and me, against the church. So it's going to make war. It's not going to be like, oh, let's have a friendly conversation about it and see if we can come to some kind of middle ground agreement. It's like, no, you're either in God's team or you're not. And he's saying, look, there's, there's going to be this war against the way of God in this life until Christ returns and fixes everything. So they get conquered and they kill them, which means there's going to be martyrs. Right now, a, a quick word. Well, there's a difference when a preacher says a quick word and non-preacher says a quick word. But <laughs> Okay, for a preacher, this would be a quick word on persecution. Um, Sometimes we have a misunderstanding, especially in this country, of what persecution really is. All right. There are different types and levels of persecution. Jesus speaks about this in the Sermon on the Mount, actually. Okay. Um, so there is the overt persecution that John and the early church were facing. And they're being fed to lions. They're being imprisoned. They're being tortured and killed in all kinds of horrific ways. Um, that is still happening in our world. Um, sometimes um, we're pro we've been protected by it because of the country we've been blessed in with all of our freedoms. Um, but statistically, there's more Christians being martyred now than any other time in human history. Um, if you want resources on it, there's one organization called The Voice of the Martyrs, another one called o Open Doors USA. And they work to bring God's word into closed churches where persecution is incredibly high, where people are being tortured and imprisoned and killed 
for their faith. There is a different level of persecution that Jesus references in the Sermon on the Mount, which is when people speak poorly of you or revile you or say all kinds of things about you on my behalf. The reality of life is that in our country, with our freedoms that we've been blessed with, that tends to be the level of persecution that we face. Right? It's not so much physical, like many of our brothers and sisters in the world, it's more the verbal that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but here's the reality is that it, it exists in the time of John. It exists here and now in our world because it's going to last until Christ returns. So my encouragement is, um, the reason I shared those organizations with you, is that as a church, um, don't let, like, we don't want to be ignorant to the fact that, hey, there's a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ around the globe that are facing the same kind of things that John and the early church were facing. We don't want to be oblivious or ignorant of that just because we're not facing those same levels. Does that make sense? They're kind of these levels, okay. So the beast comes up. Um, the Greek word for beast that's used here is therion, and therion literally means snake or serpent. Um, you can read about Acts 28 is where Paul gets bitten by a viper or a snake, and everybody around the camp freaks out because, you know, it's a viper. You know what Paul does? He just goes, oh, ow, and tosses it in the fire, and everybody in the camp just takes a big step back from Paul. And they're like, well... You don't seem normal. Um, so, but that's just an example of the same word being used there as when it's translated as snake. Why is it translated as beast here? Um, well, you can thank the King James Bible. Because um, as English speakers, we've never really gotten away from using some of the language of the King James Bible. And the King James translated it as beast. And that kind of became the image, right? There's, there's the mark of the beast. There's this beast in Revelation that comes out of the abyss or comes out of the sea. So... But I'm pointing out that it's Therion, it's snake, because how is Satan described at certain points in Scripture? He's the serpent going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, which means, wow, there's been opposition to God's word and God's way since when? The Garden of Eden, which means it's going to be here now. All right, so opposition is certain. So a couple of passages, Ezekiel chapter um, 20, verse 39. As for you, house of Israel, this is what the Lord God says. Go and serve your idols, each of you, but afterward you will surely listen to me and you will no longer defile my holy name with your gifts and idols. So uh, what happened in in this description from Ezekiel is that this suffering brings about repentance, right? That God is working through it to um, wake people up to the results of idolatry and rebellion against him, which is why um, John, after he says that he's going to kill them, their dead bodies will lie in the main street of the great city, which figuratively or spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where there are also, their Lord was crucified, and some of the people's tribes, languages, and nations will view their bodies for three and a half days and not permit their bodies to be put in a tomb. Those who live on the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. So we see Ezekiel uses the language of gifts. John uses it here. Oftentimes, gift this gift-giving idea was used within idol worship. So what we have here is that there's this celebration on earth when the prophets are killed. There's, there's this, cel- not by the people of God, but by the enemies of God, right? That there's this celebration that, good, oh good, we got the prophets to shut up. We got them to stop telling us how wicked and evil we were and that we have to repent and turn to the ways of God. We got, we got them to be quiet, which is kind of where our world is at right now. We want the people that are sharing God's word, not just meaning preachers, but all God's people, that are sharing the truth of God's word, to be quiet about that truth from the Bible. 
We want you to be quiet about what the Bible says about sexuality. We want you to be quiet what the Bible says about justice. We want you to be quiet about what the Bible says about um, abortion. We want you to be quiet about all these other things, right? So what happens is when they see here in Revelation 11, the prophets, the witnesses being killed, they celebrate. Why? Because they get to keep worshiping their idols and not to hear it anymore. Right? So it's still happening in our day. The people want um, the word of God to be closed. And they don't want to hear the, the truths of scripture be preached about. All right. So we have this going on. Now I want to draw your attention to Ephesians chapter 6. Um, for the sake of time, we're not going to read these verses. This is the armor of God. All right. So this was always my favorite Sunday school lesson because I got to make a sword. Okay. And my mom would always be like, how was Sunday school? I was like, it was great. Yeah. And then my brother and I would sit in the pews uh, fighting each other with the swords and bless my mother for trying to, you know, keep that quiet. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, um, so Ephesians chapter, oh, I'm sorry. It's cha- Ephesians 6 verse 10 is where it starts, not 1 through 10. Um, Um, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Right. So if you keep reading um, um, verses 13 and following, you get more descriptions of what the armor and the breastplate, and the sword, and all these things represent. So what is Paul saying? Well, he's saying what John is saying. They're just using different language, right? John is basically showing you what that battle looks like. So Paul says, you need to put on the full armor of God so that, why? You can stand against the schemes of who? The devil, which means, like John just said in verse 11, or Revelation 11, the beast comes up and declares what? War on the witnesses, war on God's people. And so he, John in Revelation is giving us kind of a picture of what does that warfare look like that Paul is telling us is going to happen. So we need the armor of God because we are in a battle. So similarly... To what I said in my sermon this morning, that like you don't have a choice. You and I are ambassadors. Like you don't get to pick and choose if you're in the fight. You don't get to pick and choose if you're in the middle of the war. Uh, Satan has declared war on you because you love Jesus. You and I get to choose how we respond. Do I respond in my own power? Do I respond against temptation and sin in my own strength? Or do I respond by putting on the full armor of God so that He will protect me? Right. And then there's also this important teaching from Paul. It says, hey, our battle is not against flesh and blood. So other humans, this is tricky, are not ultimately the enemy. All right? They're the ones that we are to plead with to be reconciled to God. They're the ones that we are to shine our light towards. They're the ones that we share the word of God with so that they will become part of the family of God. Right? Imagine if John... And the early church decided, you know what? The Romans are really mean to us. So we're done sharing the gospel. Right? We can't even fathom it. We're just like, oh, the apostles, the early church, they just kept sharing the gospel. Why? Because they understood, are the Romans the ones persecuting them? Yeah. Who did they keep sharing the gospel with? The Romans. Read how many times Paul is arrested and he starts converting the jailers. The jailer's like, what are you doing? We're singing hymns. You want to hear about the Lord? Sure. And then the jailer's like, well, I guess I'm a Christian now. And Paul ends up baptizing them like half the time, right? So they understood that, yeah, there is this war going on. But it's the schemes of the devil. It's the the power of these evil spirits that are fighting against God's people, not other humans. Other humans are our opportunity to share the gospel and bring into the family, Okay. All right, so opposition is certain that there's good news. Victory is also certain. So verse 11, after the prophets have been killed, but after three and a half days, so again, a temporary time, right? 
The breath of life from God entered them. That's an Old Testament phrase that God himself uses that when he says, when he breathes into his spirit into somebody, they have life. When he takes his breath away, you no longer have life. Always the play on words is that both in the Hebrew and the Greek, the word for breath and the word for spirit are the same thing. So it's when God's spirit is in someone or not in someone, they have life. So God breathes life into them. Just like Ezekiel in the valley of the dry bones, right? He breathes life and there's resurrection. God entered them and they stood on their feet. Great fear fell on those who saw them. The party, like, you know, they're like, woo, dancing on their graves, quite literally, right? They're having a celebration and all of a sudden they pop back up and are resurrected and they're like, oh no, we didn't know that was possible, Right? Um, so there's great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. At that moment, a violent earthquake took place. A tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Take note, the third woe is coming. So there's this resurrection for God's people. That's our victory. Our victory is the resurrection. Our victory is Christ returning. Okay, our victory is not going to be in this lifetime. We're not here to win a war. We're here to share the gospel. Um, Jesus is the one that conquers. Jesus is the one that rules and reigns and gives Victory. So the hope for John and the early church, the hope for you and I is that, okay, yeah, the witnesses are killed. Yes, there's persecution, but there's also resurrection. And then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And there's a great summary of our victory. So if you're unfamiliar with the language of the Bible, the prince and ruler of this world is who? It's Satan. Um, God has given him authority. You're gonna read in Revelation 12 and 13 about that authority of how he has power on this earth to torment God's people. So the language here is the kingdom of the world, all, which is uh, John, and if you read his letters, he speaks this way. The world representing the forces that are against God and God's people has now become the kingdom of Jesus. That's our victory, is that when Jesus returns, he becomes the ruler over all things. That Satan's rule and reign does not last forever. And that's why Jesus is the one that set, is told of he will reign forever and ever. Again, our victory as Christians is not here on earth, it's not in this life. It's through resurrection and it's through the rule and reign of Jesus. He is our victory. And then we get a song from the elders and at the very end, this language in verse 19 about the temple of God and the Ark of the Covenant. So the temple of God in heaven was opened and the Ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, an earthquake and severe hail. So why in this whole celebration of God's victory is the Ark of the Covenant there? Um, from the Old Testament, because the Ark of the Covenant doesn't exist in the New Testament. I love Indiana Jones. Nobody knows where it is, okay? Um, there's one really cool, credible theory that it's on an island in a lake in Ethiopia. And you can go to that island, but they will not open the door to show you the ark. So, who knows? Um, <clears throat> but nobody knows where it is. Uh, most likely it was destroyed during the time of Jeremiah. But in the Old Testament, here are a few things that the ark did or represented. Okay, it gave the people of Israel victory in battle. If you read about a lot of their battles, the ark of the covenant kind of leads the way meaning God is with them, God is fighting for them. Um, it gave people of Israel victory over sin. That's where the high priest made the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the, the ultimate sacrifice that would cover all the sins of all the people for that year. All right? And then it also led the people of Israel into the Promised Land. When they crossed the Jordan with Joshua into the Promised Land, how did they cross? 
the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant into the waters, the waters parts, and then God guides them in. So why is Jesus using this language of the Ark? Well, because it's the same for you and I. It's representing God's presence, that he's giving us victory in battle over Satan, sin, and death. He's given us victory over sin through his sacrifice. If you want to read about that, read the book of Hebrews. Um, and then it led them into the promised land. Well, his presence leads us into our promised land, which is heaven, being in the temple with him forever. All right, so that's Revelation chapter 11.